Let's get right. Today's daf is daf nun. So we are starting over here from daf nun amara aleph. And it's, we're going to about three lines from the top. So let me make it a little bigger. And if you recall yesterday that the, um, we were discussing that in Usha, the Sanhedrin, when the Sanhedrin was uh, stationed in Usha, in this place called Usha, so they made this new, uh, they made the obligation, there's an obligation uh, that you have to support your kids till they're six years old. But then after that, you can just uh, walk them out of your house. But the, they made a new takana, the new, new rule that there's a mitzvah to give your kids up until their bar mitzvah or up until their bas mitzvah. So that was one takana of Usha. The other takana of Usha, we just briefly t- discussed it yesterday at the end of the page, was that if um, if uh, your if somebody writes all his assets to his kids, a father decides for whatever reason, he writes all his assets to his kids. So his kids can walk around and say, uh, thank you, dad. Uh, now go go make a living because we're not going to give you any food. So on this, on this, the Gemara says, no, even though he wrote all his assets belong to his kids, they still have to provide him with food. Um, that's that was the that was another statement that was Ula, that was stated in Usha. And here comes the third statement. Amareb Eloi, but Usha Hiskino. This is um uh, in Be'usha, they made a new rule. Hamel Vazbez. If someone's very generous, you should not give him away more than 20% of his assets to tzedakah. Because the concern is that if you, if you give away a lot and then you face financial losses before long, you can you can be on the other side of the fence, you know, on the collecting side of the fence. So therefore, they made a rule that we're not going to allow anybody who decides to write away his assets it should be not more than 20%. Tanya Nami we learned in a Braisa, Ahamavazbez, if you want to dish out your money, Aliyavazbez Yoisim Echaimish, don't give more than 20%. Why? Shema Yitzarech Labriyoz. Maybe you, if you give away too much of your money, you're going to become a, a, somebody who has to come on to people. And the Gemara says a story. There was this person. One person, he want, he was a rich guy or whatever, I don't know. He was a generous person. He wanted to give away more than 20% of his assets. But his friend stopped him. Umani, on who was his friend? Rabbi Yeshevav. Rabbi Yeshevav stopped him from uh, dishing out more than 20%. The Amri law, and others say the story is Rabbi Yeshevav. Rabbi Yeshevav was the person that was generous and he wanted to dish out well, more than 20% of his assets to tzedakah, and his friends didn't allow him. Umani, who's his friend? Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva stopped Rabbi Yeshevov from uh, donating more than 20% of his assets. Alma Rav Nachman, Vitema Rav Achabayakov. Rav Nachman, and some say Rav Achabayakov said this, my Kara, what is the Pasik? Where is there a remez in the Torah that 20% is max? Because it says, by Yaakov Avinu, when he made his pr- deal with Hashem, if he would save him when he on his way to love him and all the trials that he's going to face, the, he, Yaakov said, asher titenli, everything that you're going to give me, aser, asren Allah. Uh, 10%, I'm going to take off 10% for you. So he said 10% twice. 10% plus 10% is 20%. That's exactly it. So the Gemara asks a question, wait a second. If you take off 10%, let's say you have a $100, you take off 10%, that's $10. Then you take off 10% of the remaining, you have, you're only taking off $9 because you only have uh, 90 remaining. So it's less than 20%. So that Gemara says, how do you say it's 20% from this Pasuk, Aser, Asren, Olach, Vahaloi Dami, Isura, Basra, Isura, Kama. The next, the, the second 10% is less than the first 10%. It's not the same. Amar um, Asher of Sayyidi says, Asremi la basra kikama. We make the 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 second asremi means I'm gonna come. What he meant to say is that the second 10% is gonna be in same value as the first 10%. That means asrenu. I'm gonna redo the first 10%, which is this just like the first 10% was 10. In, in our case, it's 10. So the second 10% was also a 10, not nine. So the bottom line is, which we just learned, 
is that a person should not give away 20% of his assets. Now, I want to point out to you, it's very important, that what we're discussing over here is when it comes to a mitzvah, like the mitzvah of tzedakah, or any other mitzvah that you're supposed to, let's say, esrig. I mean, let's say there's only one esrig in the whole neighborhood, and you and, and it'll cost you more 20% of your assets. You should give away not more than 20% of your assets for this mitzvah. But that's called a, a positive commandment. But when it comes to a negative commandment, let's say Mechal Shabbos, or let's say somebody uh, forces you to speak Lashon Hara, then you have to give up your entire your entire uh, wealth, not to be not to transgress a negative commandment. So that's why Min Hadin, if your boss forces you to you know say some Lashon Hara, and if you're not going to say the Lashon Hara, you're going to lose your job. Technically, Min Hadin. Um, you, you're, you're supposed to lose your job and 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 not be over, not transgress that negative commandment. That's a very um, uh, important point over here. The only thing is that tzedakah also has a negative commandment to it. The Torah says, Le six bets yod, le salmets, le That's this week's parsha. If you go through this week's parsha, I hope after we are learning, you go through the parsha, you'll see the parsha of tzedakah is written in this week's sedra, and there's also negative commandments associated with it. You have to, uh, have to understand. Anyway, that's the that's the that's the bottom line. Uh, again, if 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 all the rich people would at least that we know of would give ten percent of their money, at least ten percent of their money to tzedakah, then there would not be any problem in for any institution because the the massive amount of wealth. It's the problem is that the people have a hard time even giving ten percent. Alma Rabshimi Bar Ashi. Rabshimi Bar Ashi said, "We had." Three statements, we have three statements by Rab Ella. And, and each one of them discussed what was in Usha. So Ushmu is halo, misma'ates, vahalaches. It goes lower and lower. The first statement was Omar Abelo, Omar Abshimim, Omar Shlokish, Mishum, the Rabbi Yehuda, Yeshua Bar Hanina. That was the first. So three people said it. That was discussing about your children, supporting your children. The second statement was Rabbi Loi saying in the name of Rish Lakish. And the third statement, which we learned over here, is Omar Rab Ella by himself. So if you want to remember the three statements, the, the three statements, Misma'etis Vahilechis, you subtract the name and you keep going. So the first, the first time he said it was in the name of three people, then in the name of two people, and then the name of one person. And the three three comments that he made, the three halachas that this Rab Ella told over, Vesimara, is ketanim. Like we said, the, uh, the halacha of that you, it's a mitzvah to give your kids under bar mitzvah food. Kasvu, the halacha of what happens if someone writes all his assets to his children. They have to give him. They have to give him food. Ubizbizu and the uh, uh, and the comment that we discussed over here is how much of your assets you should give away to tzedakah. New gemara, but this is also very relevant uh, 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 gemara to know. Omar Rav Yitzchak, Rav Yitzchak said, "Beusha hiskini." You can remember this gemara because maybe you, you, you grew up with it. In Usha, they made a rule. Till your son is 12 years old, you speak softly to him. If he's not into learning, don't go too hard on him. Well, you know, he's kinderish, so let him play. But after 12 years old and he's still, you know, on the video games and not paying attention in the learning, unbelievable. You have to give him petch. Rashi said, let's go on the Rashi. To whip him with a whip. Rashi says, and don't give him supper. You know, that's it. You know, you try to force the issue after 12. So that's a fascinating thing. Aini, Aini, uh, the Gemara asks a question. Wait a second. You have to wait till 12 till you start forcing the issue. I'll prove it to you that you should be even less than 12. You should give patch. Rav said to Rav Shmuel Bashelis, Shmuel Bashelis was a teacher. He said like this, he ran the schools. But see, if you have a boy who's under six years old, don't accept him to the school. Barshiks, if he's six years old, accept him to the school. But when you start teaching a six-year-old, stuff him like you stuff an ox. You try to fatten an ox. You, you stuff him, you stuff him, you stuff Let him, you know, learn a lot. 
So the Gemara understood that to mean that if if you you really be harsh on this kid and you you know if he did not learning you give him patch you really make sure that you're stuffing this learning down whether he wants it or not. So you see that even after six years old you can give patch to a kid. And says the Gemara in the truth is like this not that that's not what he meant. Safe like Kisura. You could stuff his learning like you stuff an ox. And once teach him a lot. When you're younger, uh, and you're younger, uh, it's best not to waste time. The best it's just teach the kids the chumuchet Just keep teaching and teaching and teaching. Because when you're younger, you could absorb it's very fast. You know whether you get it or you don't get it, but it's it's very important. It's hard to learn uh, learn it when you're older. Neil, but after at that time, any yared imay lechayev ad laachas teim asrishana. But you don't give him patch, and you don't uh, you don't chase him down and and hold back up until after twelve years old. But the learning has to be a type of learning where where you te- you know you're teaching him a lot. And I remember in, in, when I was in elementary school, we had yeshiva on Sunday from nine to six. Even though I was like in fourth fifth grade, we were nine to six. But Sunday was a regular day. And uh, the Manal wanted you to finish Hamisha Chumshi Tyrants, a lot of Mishnayas, you know, to learn a lot at that age. That's the one way to answer it. The Iba is saying, if you want, I can answer it. Loikash, it's not difficult. Hola Mikra. When it comes to Chumish, then after six, you have to start giving patch. Hola Mishnah. When it comes to Mishnayas, then you don't force it on Jew, uh, on a on a kid until after he's twelve. So that resolves the 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 two questions: whether you give patch after six or after twelve. The Amar Abaya Abaya said, "Amli aim." My mother told me, "Bar shis when somebody is turned six years old, lemikra. That's when he st- should start learning chumish. Bar esar when he's ten years old, lemishna. Then he should start learning mishnayis. Bar tlesar when he's twelve, when he's thirteen, when he's thirteen years old." Means doesn't mean thirteen. He means he's twelve in a day. He's in his thirteenth year. So you mechanech him for letanisa for fast meis leis from twenty four hours. So at you know twelve years old, you know for chinech even midaraisa he doesn't have to fast. But you try to mechanech him uh, to fast twenty four hours. Ubi tinaikis for a girl baltresa when she turns twelve. In other words, she turns eleven in a day. Then they should really be fasting twenty four hours. Now that the Gemara mentioned something about Abaya saying a statement from his brother, Amar Abaya, Abaya said. Now I got to tell you that Abaya, uh, in the story of the Gemara, is never had any parents. His parents died young, but he was raised by this lady who, who um, I guess, who who he was so proud to call his mother, and he learned a, he learned a lot of wisdom from her, and therefore the Gemara will always quote that Abaya will say, Amar a my mom said to me. Hi Barshis. If there was a six-year-old, the Tarkele Akraba Biyoma the Mishlishis, he was bitten by a scorpion on the day that he turned six, Loi Chaye, he would not live. So the Gemara says, My Asuse. In other words, it's such a deathly poison that if you don't do this remedy, he's gonna certainly die. My Asuse. So what is the remedy for it? What is what was his, uh, and this, these, the Gemara, like you find often in the Gemara that the Gemara will give you a remedy. I don't know if it holds up in science, but the Gemara is saying that the remedy is merirte de daya chivarta, a white vulture. You take the bile of a white vulture and you mix the bile, beshikra in beer, neshafye, you rub it on the wound, menashkiye, and you give, him, you give the child to drink. Somehow that will heal him and that he will, he will, uh, Survive this uh, scorpion bite. Hi bar shita. If there was a six-year-old kid, the hi bar shata. The tarik le zibura biyomid the mishlem shata. If you have a six-year-old kid that got bitten by a wasp on the day that he, you know, became six years old, loy chaye, he's not going to live. Maya si say, what's the remedy for being bitten by a wasp? Atzafsa the dikla b'mayi. Take the uh, palm fibers and you put it in water. You rub it on the wound, and you give him to drink. So how? So these are uh, uh, statements that Abaya got from his mother regarding uh, um, somebody who got bitten by a, a scorpion or a wasp. Amar Raf, and I love this. Um, uh, the, the question that the Gemara now is dealing with: How young should you send the kid to yeshiva? So Amar Raf Ketina Raf said, "Call Hamachnes as Benoi Pachas Meben Sheish." 
whoever sends his son less than six years old to yeshiva, he will run after him and he won't catch up to him. So what does that mean? What, what does that mean? So that means um, that means he's uh, you're going to try to, you know, it's too early. So basically, you're going to try to chase after him to make him better, and you'll never be able to make him better because uh, he's it's a dangerous thing because of the pressure of going to yeshiva so early. He's uh, Rashi says Masukin Hu Lamus from his weakness, he can very dangerous, he can die. So it's too early to send a kid less than six years old to Yeshiva. The Ika de Amri, others say, no, it's a great thing. He got such an early start, his friends will start chasing after him in his knowledge. They say they can't catch up to him because once you start early at a young age and you you started, you know, educating yourself, even below six, it's hard for other people to catch up to you. The Tervayu is new, and it's possible to have both uh, to resolve both uh, ways of uh, sending is it good or is it not good. Chalish, you become weak going too early to yeshiva, the gummer, but you end up knowing a lot more. Ibayasema, others want to say, others want to say, how the chish, how the bari. It depends. If you see your child is weak, you know, he's not such a strong kid, don't send him too early. Hadabari, but if you see your child is a strong kid, don't leave him at home. Send him right away to yeshiva. You know, don't push him off, in other words, to a higher grade, uh, to, to start school late so he'll be the oldest in his grade. And okay, well, he, he didn't have that early start. And it's uh, it's he loses out. That's what the Gemara says. Amma Rabbi Yaisi Bachanina. Rabbi Yaisi Bachanina said, they made a rule in Usha. A woman sold. We discussed this before. A woman owns property. The property belongs to her. The deed is in her name. But the father, the husband could eat the rental, could get the rental income. What happened? She sold it. And her husband was alive. And Umesa, and then she died. Well, really, she had no right to sell it because. If she died, then the husband takes ownership of the property. So she basically sold something that did not belong to her. So the Gemara says, The husband, who is like the first buyer, he's he can you know call back the sale because this was an illegal sale. Rabbi Yitzchak found Rabbi Usha. He was in the public square in Usha. So this Rabbi Bo was in the public square, and Rabbi Yitzchak found him there. Who said over this statement of Usha with a woman selling the Nuchsev Elok? He said Rabbi Yitzchak. The author of it was Rabbi Yitzchak. So the Gemara says, so Rabbi Yitzchak was so excited about this teaching, he studied it 40 times. It's like as if he put it into his pocket. In other words, He's almost, not that he's not going to forget it, but it's you know, going to be hard for him to forget it because he studied it so much time. What the Gemara likes to teach you is that if you really want to get to know something, you got to study a lot and to, uh, often, often say it again and again and again, and then you won't forget it. The Gemara Darshan is a Pasuk in Tehillim. Ashrei Shoimrei Mishpat. Very praiseworthy is a person that Shoimrei Mishpat, he's very careful to do justice. In other words, he's very honest in business. I said tzedakah, and he does tzedakah, b'chol eis, at every moment. So that's a person. It's not enough to do tzedakah. More important is to do things honestly. But if you do things honestly, and you do tzedakah at every time, then you're a praiseworthy person. You're an MVP. Now, how is it possible to do tzedakah every minute? If he actually lost his tzedakah, b'chol eis, what does the Pasuk mean? You're doing charity every minute. How is that possible? Some say Rabbi Lezer made this statement. It refers to whoever gives his children and supporting his children when they're after six, before Bar Mitzvah, so he's constantly providing for them. That's a tzedakah. So, so this is like the, the famous adage, charity begins at home. So that's that's called tzedakah. You're doing tzedakah every day, every moment. Rabbi Shmuel Ba'na 
even if you don't have children, it refers to he raises an orphan in his house, Umasian, and doesn't let them, you know, roam the street, but he makes sure to, to get them married. That is a tzedakah b'chaleis. Then we say, a person who has wealth in his house and his charity remains forever, even after he's gone. What does that refer to? Rav Hun and Rav Chizda, Rav Hun and Rav Chizda both said, or had an argument what it, what it refers to. Chad Omar, one uh, most valuable play, player, that's uh, uh, in baseball. Chad Omar, one said, Zehaloi Mitoim Lamda. You, you know what? If you want to have a legacy long after you pass on from the world, so you're teaching Torah, you learn Torah by yourself, so you're wealthy, and you teach it to other people. That's why it's so important to have like a, a Seder with somebody that you're teaching Torah to, somebody that 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 knows less than you. Because that, that tzedakah remains long after you're gone because he that the one that you teach to will teach it to others and it's, that's the way it goes. And one said that the Pasuk is referring, referring to Zeakhoisef Teir and Nevi'im Aksum, who writes for himself a Torah and Nevi'im Aksum, who mash'ilan lachem, he wrote a Sefer Torah and lends it to other people. Or it could refer to somebody who prints Svarim. He pays money for authors to print Svarim. He helps authors print Svarim. And, and it gets spread, Torah gets spread all over the world. So long after you pass, you, you know, a person could open up a Sefer, a book, written by somebody and says, oh, this was the donated by so-and-so because he paid and helped defray the printing costs. So that's a beautiful thing where if it's at Kosei and Medeslad, your tzedakah could last long after you pass. You will see sons to your sons. You'll have grandchildren. Peace on Yisrael. What does that mean? You see grandchildren, automatically there's peace. As soon as you have grandchildren, Shalom al Yisrael, it's peace for the Jew, for the Jewish people. Because now you will, you're, you're, you won't come to Chalitza and Yibam. Because as long as a person just has a son, let's say he has only one son. So there's a possibility that his one son will die, and then his wife will fall to Yibam in case he dies. Because, because now he has no... Uh, living offspring, but once his son already had another child, so even if his son dies, he his wife would not fall to Yibim when he dies because he has a grandchild still around. So that gives peace, Lebene Yisrael, because Chalitza and Yibim is always a complicated uh, thing because Chalitza is embarrassing and also Yibim could be also be something that the the wife does, the, girl, the lady doesn't want and she could be forced into a marriage. So that the fact that you don't have to come that's peace. Reb Shmuel Bar Nachmenu, Amar Reb Shmuel Bar Nachmenu says, "Kevan Shabanim Levanecha Shalom Al Al Dayon Yisrael Day Asi LeInsuyeh." Beautiful thing. As soon as a person has grandchildren and a family, then there's the the court system are uh, uh, you know it's peaceful for the court system because nobody's going to fight over your estate because if a person dies without any relative, without any children. So then you have all these distant relatives coming and saying that, you know, we were close to him and that, you know, the assets, uh, the state belongs to us. So there's all the different back and forth lawsuits. But when a person has children, it's very straightforward. It, his children shouldn't inherit it before anybody else. So that's uh, that's why it says, when you have great children and grandchildren, it's peace, uh, uh, brings peace, Al Yisrael, onto the Jewish people. We go to Ahmed Beis. What we're talking about over here, when a man dies, right? So we learned that there is an obligation that from his estate, you have to give his daughters are entitled to food from his estate. Now, the question is, when a man dies, where are the, where, where are the girls going to get the money from? from? Uh, the, the boys inherit the estate. Well, how do they uh, pay for uh, the food that they're obligated to give to the daughters. So does it means, does the daughters have a claim? Let's say the guy left over gold clufflings. So will they sell his gold clufflings so they can have food? So we're going to learn now is that no, they only have a claim against the land. If he left over real estate, they would sell part of the land to support the, the food obligated to the daughters. That's what he says. Yosef, Rav Yosef, Kamei, Rav Nuna. 
And Yosef was sitting in front of Rabbi Nuna. The Yosef Rabbi Nuna of Kama. Rabbi Nuna was ta- discussing this, and he says, "Kishem she'in habonim yarshim el merkarka." Now, there's a misunderstanding here, but what they're trying to say is just like the boys. If there was boys and their father died, they only inherit real estate. There's no such a thing of inheriting your father's gold cufflings. So when you're feeding the girls, they only could take their rights for food, only element of from, from from real estate. This makes no sense. The whole world was shushkining of what Rav Hanunu meant to say. If a person leaves over real estate, then his kids inherit what he has. The Loishovic Ara Lo Yarsalebene. If he didn't leave over real estate, let's say he has no real estate, but he has suits and then cufflings and watches, his children will not inherit it. What's going on over here? What is uh boys inheriting only karka? So Amalai Rav Yosef, Rav Yosef explained the Dilma Ksubas Benin Dichran, the Ksuba that the sons inherit. In other words, like this: a man has two wives, let's say. He has boys from one wife and boys from another wife. So the din is that, let's say, if their mother dies, right, if their mother dies, they, and then he dies, right, the halacha is that they inherit their mother's ksuba, the, each children from each mother inherits their mother's ksuba, and then the rest of the estate is split equally, is split between the, the children. In other words, uh, the, the halacha is that the ksuba belonging to the woman goes to her children, not to somebody else's children. And that halacha, that boys have a claim to inherit their uh, their mother's ksuba, that claim only uh, uh, takes a, a you know claim only against the real estate of the of of the person, not against not his movable assets. And that's what they what that's what Rav Humanuna meant to say. Just like the boys inheriting their mother's ksuba, don't take don't take ass don't take uh, movable items for their mother's ksuba, but they only can have a claim against the real estate to collect their mother's ksuba. So also the daughters who are collecting food are only collecting from from uh, real estate, and that's what Rabbi Yosef. So Rabbi Yosef was saying, "Did you Rav Hamanuna min, mean that the Dilma Ksuba has been in different karma?" Amalei. So Rav Hamanuna says, "Mar Rav Yosef, sir, the Gavra Rabahu, you must be a great person because your da ma kamina. You understood what I meant to say. I never meant to say because the world was misunderstanding Rav Hamanuna. Everybody was saying, "Oh, Rav Hamanuna said that um, nobody can inherit uh, your father's watches and and cufflings and that." That's not what he's meant to say. He meant to say boys inheriting their mother's ksuba and they have a claim against their father's assets. So that claim only is claimed against karka on real estate, not against the movable uh, metalpolin belonging to the father. So the bottom line Rav Hamnuna said, and this is the most important point of the daf, that girls, when their father died, they don't have a claim against the movable items that the father had. If father had like a Bentley automobile, they can't say, I want the, the, the car to be sold so we'll have enough for food. No, they could only demand that real estate be sold so they can get food, but not the movable items. Um, but not everybody agreed to that. Omar Abhiya Bar Yosef, Abhiya Bar Yosef said, Rav Zon Mechite Dalia. Rav it seemed to uh, he, Rav when uh, uh, girls came to him, they lost their father. He required them to get food from the wheat, the aliyah, the aliyah. We don't know what this word aliyah means. Uh, the pashtus it means maybe that he's requiring them to eat food by selling the movable assets of the father. Let's see, ibaylahu. What did Rav mean to say? He was giving these girls something. What was he giving these girls? Parnasa Havya. Oh, so now we're introducing another thing. Was he giving them a dowry? There's another halacha, and that everybody agrees, that when a father dies, the girls not only get food, but when they get married, they give a dowry. And, and you know, like, like a dowry, they're required to get a dowry. That could be from the movable items that he had. And they, they, how do we assess what the father would have given 
if uh, if his was alive when his daughter got married? What kind of a dowry? So my Aliyah, in me Aliyah the Av, you estimate what the father would have given based on his temperament or his financial status. What would he have given? It's exactly what Shmuel said. The Amar Shmuel Shmuel said, Le Parnasa, when it comes to giving a dowry from the man's asset, Sham and Ba'avi, you try to get a picture of what the father was really like. And Bezin demands that from that assets we should give to the girls when they decide to get married. So that's what it means. He gave them for the movable assets because they were getting married, and this was a dowry, but this was not food. Or Dilma, maybe this the the, the, the girls. Are, are requesting that Rav intervene because they are demanding food. They're not ready to get married. And they're demanding food. And Rav disagreed with Rav Hamnuna. And he said, hava. Uma, ma, oh, my Aliyah. What does it mean? He gave them wheat, uh, movable items. Wheat is a movable item. It's midvarm toivim shnemer baliyah. From these great uh, smart things that were said in the attic. Because certain gedolim used to meet in an attic to discuss you know, new laws. The Amr of Yitzchak Bar Yosef, Rav Yitzchak Bar Yosef said, Ba'aliyah in an attic, Hiskinu, they made a new rule, Shehebonis Nizainis Min HaMetaltalem, that girls should get their food from Metaltal, from Uvalizim. They have a claim against his gold cufflings. Not like Rav Hamnuna. Rav Hamnuna said that the girls could only demand that the, the estate sell real estate so that they can have food. In Rav Yitzchak Bar Yosef, came up and he said no there's a they made a new rule that the girls he argued that the girls could collect from movable items Toshima come in here Bidei the Rabbi Banai in the hands of Rabbanai Achiyad Rabbiya Barab he was the brother of Rabbi Baba so this Rabbanai had in his possessions having metal and the Yasme he was like the executor executor of the assets Movable assets belonging to Yisoyman, to orphans. And, and he was uh, so he came to Shmuel because he owed the girls at least food. So Shmuel said, give them food, which means my love, he had to sell these movable items, these movable assets to, to provide for food for the girls. And therefore we see Shmuel held Kidrav Yitzchak by Yisoyman like Rabbi Yitzchak Bar Yosef, and that you can sell movable items of the estate to pay for the food for the girls. So is that a proof? So the Gemara says, that's not a proof that Shmuel held that way. Hossam there is La Parnosa Havai. It, it was regarding the dowry. For the dowry, everybody, if the girls were getting married, for the dowry, then you sell them even the movable items to provide a dowry for her. But for the food, no, maybe it's only if there's real estate. When it comes to a dowry, you estimate the father. You estimate the father what his temperament was. Uh, another uh, two more lines here. There was an incident in Nahardoi. And they and they made a judgment in Nahardoi. And and the the Dundani de Bahardoi. They made this judgment in Nardoi that means that they actually sold movable items belonging to a dead man to pay for the Mazinas for the food for his daughters. The Pompadisa was the same story as well. Agbe, that they sold movable items, the Agbe Rabchana Babizna. And Rabchana Babizna, who collected the, sold the items so that they can provide food for the daughters. So these are two stories. Uh, practical stories where Bezdin sold movable items of a deceased man in order to provide food for his daughters. Amalut Rav Nachman disagreed. Amalut Rav Nachman Zula Hadre. He told the Bezdin, "You paskin wrong. Go return the money that was sold that you took from the from the from the dead man's estate." The if you're not going to do that, I'm going to take away your homes from you. In other words, you did a serious transgression. You made a big mistake in halacha. You're not allowed to sell the, the, the deceased man's movable items to pay for food for his daughters. Only You can only sell real estate. But if he doesn't have any real estate, there is no food for the doors. The, all the movable items belong to the boys. The Gemara continues and says, one more st statement, 
Rab Ami Rab Asi Savar Lebezim Mimitalpe. Rab Ami Rab Asi wanted to give food for girls from the movable estate, from the from the, the movable items of the dead man. Amalu Rab Yaakov Bar Idi Milsa the Rab Yechon Rishlach Lei Avde Bei Uvda. Rab Yechon Rishlachish would never do such a thing. Aten Avden Lei Uvda, and you're going to do such a thing. In other words, it seems that Rab Yaakov Bar Idi held like Rav Hamanuna that you can't sell movable items. Uh, for for to provide food for the girls, you can only sell real estate. So Rabami Rabasi wanted to sell movable items. They told them that you're doing wrong if you do that. Rablaza, the more final the final case is Rablaza saw the mezam in tantalim. Rablaza wanted to sell movable items from a deceased man's estate to give food for the girls. Amar Lafana Rab Shimon Ben El Yakim. Rab Shimon Ben El Yakim said, "Rabbi," he said, "You Rablaza." I know you're not doing correctly. And why, so why do you want to sell movable items? You try, you have pity on these girls because the guy that died didn't have any real estate. He only had movable items. And if you're not going to sell the movable items, the girls are going to starve. Where are they going to get food from? So you had Rachmanis, so you're selling the movable items of the dead man's estate. But the problem is people are going to think that's the halacha. So Rabbi Shimon ben Yochum said, don't do it. Be careful. Maybe the Talmudim will see what you're doing and they're going to establish the halacha that you could sell movable items for to pay for the food. But that's not the halacha. The halacha is you can only sell as um, karka. You can't sell uh, movable items to pay for food for other girls. Okay.